Queen of England, Catherine of Aragon, has just given birth to a stillborn baby. But she hasn't had time to grieve before apologizing to everyone. Because after several deliveries, Catherine has failed to give birth to a male heir alive, except for a daughter. It is a sin of treason to King Henry VIII for a woman who puts the country at risk of having no male heir. The Duke of Norfolk, sensing that the king's affections for the queen are consumed, wishes to offer the king a mistress to comfort him. So he gallops to his brother-in-law's house in search of a mistress who will fight for his interests. Meanwhile, here is the wedding of his brother-in-law's youngest daughter, Mary Bullen. She fulfills her wish to marry William Carey, the son of a merchant to whom she has been engaged for over ten years. Having a husband who loves her more than anything else is Mary's greatest wish. Unlike simple Mary, her sister, Anne Bolin, is ambitious. A man's title and position are the most important things to Anne when she's looking for a husband. Even though Henry Percy, the sole heir to England's richest landowner, is betrothed to another woman, he can hardly escape becoming Anne's prey. Thomas Bolin has no hesitation in thrusting his complicated eldest daughter, Anne, into the Vanity Fair for the sake of wealth and position. Have me bed him instead. And worries that her reputation and prospects will be ruined by becoming the king's mistress. How will she find a good husband once the philandering King Henry has finished with her? Her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, assuages her fears immediately. He promises that if King Henry likes her, she will at least marry a duke or marquis, even if she's dumped in the future. Anne's desire for a challenge is piqued by the prospect of great gain. The next morning, she finds her sister, Mary, and shares the mission with her. From now on, Anne will make pleasing and charming King Henry her top priority. Mary, who has just become another man's wife for a day, interrupts Anne's fantasies by telling her that King Henry has a wife. As always, and never considers a man's engagement or marriage as an obstacle to her upward mobility. Mary then shares with him the secrets of a man's wedding night, such as the fact that last night her husband used a peapot right next to the bed. The two sisters are both amused and awful when it comes to men's habits. However, this battle to honor the family is strongly opposed by Anne's mother, Elizabeth Bullen. She accuses her husband of seeing ambition as a virtue rather than a sin. Unlike her husband, who is determined to achieve greater glory, she knows that even power does not mean happiness. That's why she willingly gave up her position and wealth to marry the mediocre Thomas. But her warnings would do nothing to change a man who valued honor more than life. A month later, King Henry accepts an invitation from the Bolins to come hunting with a large retinue. All the family members, servants and cooks are thrown into a chaos of preparation for the lavish feast and takes encouragement from her gentle sister and prepares herself to seduce King Henry. After a warm welcome and a bow, Thomas immediately introduces his daughter and to King Henry. Her beautiful and mysterious face quickly arouses King Henry's interest, and is then deliberately seated on King Henry's left side. Almost everyone knows that this banquet is just an excuse. They are more interested in Anne's behavior and King Henry's reaction than in the food. The next morning, Anne appears in front of King Henry in a gorgeous hunting suit. King Henry suggests that she should share a horse with him, citing her difficulty in sitting on a horse without a man to hold her up and replies that she can hold the new saddle with her thighs. Frustrated by the failure of the flirtation, King Henry gets bored and quickly signals for the hunt. Little did anyone know that the next accident would ruin the game the Bullens had set in motion. Bullens' servant, Stafford rushes to report that the king is wounded, having just chased a stag to the edge of a ravine while hunting. Everyone was about to give up, but Anne, a feisty and competitive woman, insisted on chasing the stag, causing the king, who was following her, to fall off his horse. King Henry couldn't bear the thought of breaking his pride in front of so many people more than being physically injured. Upon hearing the news, the Duke of Norfolk promptly changes his mind. Now it is not in, but Mary, whom he intends to offer to King Henry as a mistress. So Mary is assigned to care for the wounded king. When King Henry wakes up, he is captivated by this gentle, sweet, quiet woman. Unlike Anne, who is a dominant woman, she is easily ignored, but she is also eager to arouse the pity of a man whose pride has been hurt. Mary's willingness to submit to a man's wishes also gives King Henry confidence. So even though King Henry knows Mary is married, he insists on bringing her back to court. This result delights the men of Bullen's family. Even her husband, William, is willing to let her serve King Henry, as he does not want to give up the position he has arranged for him as an attendant in the Privy Council. Mary feels absurd at the suddenness of this arrangement. Her hopes of a peaceful life in the countryside with her lover are crushed. Mary's vehement refusal does not change the fact that she has become a pawn of her family's interests and even incurs in's jealousy. It's the man that didn't know who you were. I was with you in that room for half an hour and came out besotted. I don't know what you said. To protect her family's honor, Mary enters the court at the whim of her father, her uncle and her husband. Mary and Anne are assigned by the king to the queen as ladies in waiting. Catherine of Aragon realizes her husband's purpose in bringing young, beautiful women into the court. Unlike the noble women she imagined would seduce her husband, Mary couldn't write poetry or make dresses. So she makes Mary sing a song. 
With the young girl singing like a nightingale, Catherine of Aragon has no choice but to convince herself of her husband's change of heart. After dinner, a ball is held at the palace. In contrast to Anne, who thrives in the midst of the nobility, Mary is homesick. She still can't understand why Anne attempts to seduce Henry Percy when she knows he's engaged. Soon after, King Henry bursts into the ball and whispers in her ear the very thing she dreads doing. Tonight, her husband, her uncle, her father, her sister, all agree to her adulterous mission and also dresses her and advises her on how to please the king in bed. King Henry does not rush to do business when he sees her, but gently asks her what she needs. He even pours Mary a glass of water himself. King Henry says he understands what it's like to be the second child and live in someone else's shadow. His words open Mary's heart, and his thoughtfulness and tenderness let her get caught up in the trait of power and body. After a night with King Henry, any woman's matters are no longer private. Mary also has to report to her uncle, her father, her mother, her husband, the details of her sleep with King Henry. Did he have you? Yes. More than once? And was he satisfied? I believe so. Did he say so? The Duke of Norfolk is very pleased that Mary is in the king's favor. Next he'll try to help her keep King Henry so that Mary can give him a son as soon as possible, while the queen is already menopausal. So anyone who stops them from using Mary to gain honor will be thrown out, not even Mary's mother. When King Henry asks Mary if she objects to the fact that he has sent her husband on a mission to remove him from the palace, Mary replies that she will not interfere in the affairs of the state. King Henry is even more in love with a woman who has such understanding, while Mary is sleeping by the king's bedside, and is also making moves to secure a brighter future. And in Henry Percy sneaked out of the court to marry and consummate their marriage in a chapel. When her brother George Bullen announces the affair to Mary with excitement and delight, Mary is alarmed. She fears that Anne's reputation will be ruined because Henry Percy is engaged to another woman. For Anne's sake and to protect her family's reputation, Mary denounces the affair to her father and uncle. The Duke of Norfolk denounces Henry Percy and tells him to return to Northumberland to marry his fiancée. The cowardly man abandons and without even the slightest resistance. To prevent the scandal from affecting Mary's friendship with the king, they decide to banish him to the court of the Queen of France as a lady in waiting, and that makes him hate Mary, the informer, so much. For your own good. And you never would have got away with it. It would have ruined your prospects forever. Really? Well, I'm in exile, and you're here in the king's bed, not challenged for our father's affection. Her mother reassures him to take this opportunity to learn from the Queen of France and the other ladies of the court about how to be a proper woman. Meanwhile, Mary, who has received many favors from King Henry, soon discovers that she is pregnant. Henry VIII once again experiences the surprise and emotion of a father who is looking forward to having an heir after so many years. He is so excited that he even dares to kiss Mary in front of everyone in the hall. The Bolins have benefited greatly from the king's happiness. They pay off their debts with the king's vast assets and wealth. Thomas is promoted to Earl. George is not only named a Viscount, he's also given in marriage by the King to Jane Parker, the Queen's lady-in-waiting. As much as George hates Jane, he has to give in in order to take on Mary's burden and honor his family. Seeing that all three of her children are unhappy, Lady Elizabeth warns her husband that his ambitions could lead to the downfall of the family. Her warning definitely isn't an empty one. Soon afterward, Mary shows signs of having a miscarriage. Although her baby is saved this time, she is forced to lie in a dark room. King Henry never visits her again, as she is physically unfit to sleep with him. To prevent the king's favor from being taken by milk-faced girls from other families, Thomas urgently summons him back from France. He asks him to please the king and keep him thinking about Mary. However, they didn't realize that this decision would be a fatal blow. Back from her training in France with the queen, and is a different woman. Her humor and wit make everyone laugh. She captures King Henry's attention with a speech about how petty and incompetent the king of France is and also shows off her various newfound skills, such as reading fortunes and trying to seduce the king. The philandering King Henry can't resist Anne's charms and soon forgets about Mary. He begins to give Anne all kinds of precious gems and jewelry, but she returns all his gifts. This has infuriated King Henry, so he devotes his days to wooing Anne in every way he can. Anne, who is dedicated to flattering the king, returns to the palace for a few days before she has a chance to visit her pregnant sister. Mary is not happy to see her because she knows that and has come back to get back at her. You stole the king away, and then you betrayed me over Henry Percy. If Mary is just in the mindset of being a mistress maybe she won't get hurt, but the sad thing is that she's now really in love with the womanizer, King Henry. After months of lying in bed with an uninteresting pregnancy, Mary finally goes into labor. The Bullens wait anxiously to see if the baby will be a boy or a girl. But for King Henry at this point, a son is obviously less important than the charming inn. He swears not to sleep with his wife or speak to Mary again so that he can be in Anne's bed as soon as possible. While Anne is trying to whet his appetite for a little while longer, a baby boy cries loudly throughout the royal court. This suddenly causes Anne to panic. 
she immediately gives the king hope. King Henry, after a few attempts to get the consent of this tempting prey, ignores the newborn bastard and begins to fulfill his vow. King Henry orders Mary and her child to be driven back to the country. In the battle of the sisters for the king's favor, and wins the stage. The Duke of Norfolk blames and for ruining the family's honor and fortune. She offers a new plan to appease the men's anger. She plans to marry the king, become the new queen, and give birth to England's rightful male heir. Whenever the king begs and to give herself to him, she refuses. She says she can only see him in secret as long as Catherine sits on the throne next to him. So King Henry summons the council and threatens the ministers to find a way to send Catherine to a convent. But it isn't satisfied with that. She wants the king to annul his marriage to Catherine and marry her. After all, she doesn't want the child she gives the king to be called a bastard. Just as she is about to become England's new queen, an affair comes to light that threatens to destroy her. She should be grateful she had a sister who loved her. Henry Percy's wife writes to the king asking for a divorce after discovering that Henry Percy had secretly married and consummated his marriage to Anne. The king's pride is shattered and he is reminded of the woman in whom he once placed his trust. He summons Mary to the court to ask if Anne's affair is true. To protect her sister and her family, the sincere Mary has to lie to appease a man who is going crazy. Though she wants to return to the countryside, away from all the trouble, she's not destined to get out of this deal unscathed. Before the trial, the elegant Catherine stops in front of the two sisters. With the support of the people and the Pope, she insists that she will never give up her honor and power. The Boleyn whores, what did I do to upset you? Although Catherine has never bowed her head to the Boleyn sisters, the loss of the king's favor has forced her to face a great humiliation. Will you destroy your marriage, your country, your soul before God on the whim of one girl? Because she denies you? She wants me to step aside. Where is my wise husband? Henry VIII, after being lectured by Catherine, realizes the price he's paid. He's torn his country apart to get in, broken with the Church of Rome, and even deposed a good woman from her position as queen. Helpless, he can only take out his endless anger on Anne. Instead of being led by the nose, he possesses her by force. Soon after, Anne Boleyn marries King Henry and becomes Queen of England. And despite all her efforts and endeavors to rise to the throne, she never felt fulfilled. And prays daily for a boy to keep her honor and position forever. After a long and stressful pregnancy and an agonizing labor, her bedchamber eventually welcomed the cries of a newborn baby. But the birth of a girl could not bring her everything she wanted. Henry VIII would not even look at the daughter she named Elizabeth after his mother. During the months he hasn't been able to sleep within, he is hooked up with Jane Seymour, Anne's lady-in-waiting, and becomes so anxious that she has to resort to more degrading methods to arouse King Henry. Some time later, Anne, pregnant again, gives the greedy males of the Bullen family a shot in the arm. However, it turns out that a woman in a state of constant terror and panic can be too much for her to handle. One day, and wakes up in her sleep to discover that she has miscarried. Bury it! Get rid of it somehow! On the fire with it! Worried that others would find out the truth, and afraid of being burned like a witch, and gets a sick idea, she begs her brother George to sleep with her to get her pregnant again. Unfortunately, the scene of them in bed together is witnessed by Jane Parker, George's wife, who has long been a victim of his emotional abuse. Though she doesn't realize that in the end, George was unable to carry out this act of monstrous behavior. Jane Parker informs King Henry of the incest, having witnessed her sister and her family become consumed by ambition, Mary is devastated. She remembers a promise from a man and rides away from the treacherous court in the night. Stafford had resigned a few days before and invited her to return to the countryside with him. If you came with me, I would never betray you or take you for granted. The next morning, George is dragged from his room by the guards and put in jail. Anne, Queen of England, is charged with adultery and incest, high treason, and a crime against God. A scheming woman doesn't realize that it doesn't matter whether she actually committed these crimes or not, because the end of this trial has already been recorded in the history books by Henry VIII. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Soon after the trial, George is hauled out of the Tower of London and taken to the executioner's block. His life is cut off by an axe as he begs for God's forgiveness. Mary, a recluse in the countryside, learns of her family's misfortunes and hurries to the royal court. She desperately begs the king to forgive her sister, or at least not to kill Anne. After looking at the helpless and crying Mary, Henry VIII makes a promise that he will not harm Anne. However, all the excesses of the pursuit of fame and power would end as Elizabeth Bullen said. These gifts, this favor, will go as swiftly as it can. In the end, and walks with a heavy step and a terrible fear of being beheaded, she begs for God's forgiveness in front of the people and prays for King Henry. After gazing into her sister's despairing eyes, and tremblingly takes off her tiara and removes the necklace from around her neck. The ruthless king did not forget to show in some mercy. 
he hires one of the best swordsmen from France at great expense to make quick work of cutting off Anne's pain. Anne's death also means that King Henry has broken the promise he made to Mary. Mary realizes that the unpredictable king may forgive her one offense against his authority, but it will never happen again. With great patience, she walks out of the court in front of everyone, carrying her dead sister's only daughter, Elizabeth, in her arms. The Bullens lost all their honor overnight. Thomas Bullen dies two years later, disgraced and wretched. The Duke of Norfolk is sentenced to imprisonment and three generations of his descendants are executed for committing treason. Mary, one of the survivors of the business deal, marries Stafford and spends the rest of her life with him in the sweet peace of the countryside. And this girl, playing happily in the fields, would break Henry VIII's concern that the country had no strong, powerful male heir. Though she is not a boy, England will enter a golden age of prosperity under her 45-year reign. This strong red-haired girl would grow up to be known as Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, and Bullen's dramatic life is known to many, and she has received mixed reviews. But in contrast to her radiant personality, her younger sister Mary Bullen has remained in the shadows for centuries. In the movie The Other Bullen Girl, we get a glimpse into the life of the ordinary Mary. Mary calls herself the Other Bullen Girl because no one notices her when she stands next to the glamorous inn. She never wants to compete with and for fame or treasure, and has grown up hoping for a quiet life in the countryside with the man she loves. But when King Henry, also a second child, spoke sweet words of understanding that she had been overshadowed by her sister, she thought she had met her soulmate. She thought the king's favor would bring her happiness, but she didn't realize it would turn her sister against her. After all, having a son is what matters most to this King Henry, and no woman can compete with it. The lucky ones, like Mary, who was pregnant, were confined to bed in a dark room all day long, living like a prisoner. By the time her son was born, King Henry had already moved on and driven her and the child to the countryside. The less fortunate women, such as Catherine of Aragon or Anne Bullen, were left to hold their daughters or dead babies in their arms, weeping with disappointment and guilt after the ordeal of childbirth. Henry VIII took four more wives after beheading Anne Bullen, and he had been through six marriages in his life. He prayed for a strong son to succeed him. Even though Henry VIII was an all-powerful monarch who could change the fate of his country for the sake of one woman, he didn't get everything he wanted. This is Rainbow Movie. Let's watch a movie together and experience something different. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.